I tried to scream, but I couldn't breathe because the air was rushing so fast past me. I was like, am I supposed to breathe out of my nose, out of my mouth? Like this just, it doesn't feel like it's working very well. And then my, my, I felt my arms were numb. Like when I got to the ground, I just slumped to the ground and like everything was totally numb and, and um, with pin, uh, pins and needles and they ran over and gave me sugar and water and I laid on the ground with my feet up for like half an hour. If you do something that causes anxi you anxiety and stress and quote unquote survive it, it's a guaranteed sign that you've grown as a person. Guaranteed. There's almost no other thing in life that points us in the right direction as much as anxiety and stress. If like you don't want to do something because it makes you anxious, makes you scared, and you do it anyway, you're a better, you're a different person. I'm not gonna say better because you know I'd be anxious about taking crack cocaine. I probably would not be a better person after having done so. But you know, you will have grown in one way or another because you've overcome your fear, your anxiety. You don't let it control you. You've actually gone and done something despite it. So this is an interview with. Rick. Ray Blackney. I think Blakeney. I said it right again. Yeah, Blakeney. the Blakeney, but oh, don't sorry. worry. No, I had it right the last time. <laughs> it's. I, I told it. you we've legally looked into getting it changed because so it, everybody pronounces it wrong. Like you know, we my grandfather looked into legally put adding an e to it, and nobody because nobody pronounces it. So I had an illiterate ancestor, right, who came over on the boat from Ireland and didn't know how to spell, so they put it down wrong. Uh, and ever since it's been plaguing my family, but apparently changing your name is so difficult in the U S that my, they, they gave up on it. They're like, nah, it's not even worth the trouble of, you know, changing every single document you ever had is a pain in the butt. So we never got around to it. Fair enough. So Ray, why don't we begin by you just quickly mentioning again, what your business is, or in your case, you have a few what your businesses are, and if you don't mind saying how much they earn on average per year, or you could say collectively between the, the two or three of them. Yeah, yeah. So my main business is my main businesses are LiveLingua.com, which is an online language school. I have PodcastHawk.com. It's a SaaS product that helps you get booked on podcasts on autopilot. I would say those are the two primary ones. Um, I have plenty of other smaller projects on the sides, and we are yeah, kind of eking into the multi seven figure range here so that's combined between all of them. all right sounds good so of the businesses you have which one makes you the most excited well i have i have adhd and of course the newest stuff is the one that makes me most excited right the shiny object syndrome uh right now i would say podcast hawk i've been running live lingua now for 15 years so you know shiny object not quite so much um but podcast hawk is my shiny object i'm a computer engineer by training but for some reason this was my first SaaS. Um, and we'll talk, I'm sure a little bit about it on this one, but I'm a computer programmer. And so I thought, Hey, I'm going to hire some programmers to write this for me because I'm a computer programmer. I should be able to manage programmers, right? Yeah. It doesn't quite translate that easily. I, I am finding, right. It's much easier when I build stuff myself. Um, but that's kind of the one that's the most exciting yeah, because as a SaaS, LiveLingua is a productized service. So I, you know, if you, if I have a thousand people, students came in tomorrow, wanted to take Spanish or Chinese lessons with us, Mandarin lessons. I would have to go and find enough teachers to account for them because I don't have a hundred teachers just sitting there waiting in case a thousand people sign up tomorrow. Right. With a SaaS product that doesn't happen. Right. With I could go in, all I have to do is a 10,000 people signed up tomorrow. I might have to go into my digital ocean server and drag a little bar and take the memory up and hit save just so that, you know, it can handle 10,000 more people on the website. That is all I would need to scale. I mean, I, you know, just a little drag and click and literally within a few seconds, it would handle 10,000 more users. That's, you know, that's the beauty of SaaS. That's why SaaS sells for multipliers of 10, 20 X, if you can get it up to at least seven figure. So what is your biggest fear? Oh, um, that all my businesses fail and I have to go and get a job. And <laughs> that, uh, how long would you say you've had that fear for? Ever since my business has succeeded about 12 or 13 years ago, because I found out I actually love being an entrepreneur. And my worst case scenario is having to go and work for somebody else. Like my skill set, I'm a computer programmer with 15, 20 years of experience. I have 15 years of SEO experience. I'm pretty good at Facebook ads and Google ads. I can get a job, right? I mean, you know, some, especially in today's market where there are not enough computer programmers out there, like everybody's scram scrambling to find a good computer programmer. I could probably get a job in a week. Um, add on top of that, you know. Being an entrepreneur, you have to have a certain level of self-confidence. And on top of that, that I know how to run businesses. I know how to do marketing. I know how to do all that. You're not just getting a computer programmer with me. You'd be getting somebody who can, you know, take on a CTO role, take on even, you know, higher roles in your company, all for that. But I don't want that. So my worst case scenario is I have to go and get a six-figure job. So then how do you protect yourself from realizing that fear? Okay, so this is... 
Yeah, this is very, the timing for this interview is great because we actually, in live language, we had one of the biggest down slumps ever we've had in 15 years, about 60 days ago, right? So I've had to lay some people off recently to kind of keep us on survival level in order to kind of recover. Um, and I consider myself a pretty calm person, but stress is part of being an entrepreneur. Uh, and I will admit, and I'll admit it openly here because a lot of entrepreneurs were supposed, you know, when you see us on stage, when I speak on stage, you just hear about the successes, not necessarily the failures or the downturns. I went through two weeks where I was so stressed out and had so much anxiety. It gave me anxiety-induced insomnia. And I only slept two hours a night for 14 days straight. Uh, don't recommend it. It's not a lot of fun. And it took a lot for me to get out of it. You guys, you know, you're catching me actually kind of only one or two weeks out of it. And the getting out of it involved having to support my family and friends. Um talking to other business people as an entrepreneur, we'd kind of t tend to focus, well, especially when you only sleep two hours a night, you trust me, you're only focusing on the problem, not on the solution. And that is not a good place to be at. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help was what I've learned out of this entire, out of that experience. I've been an entrepreneur for 15 years and honestly, I've never actually had a major downturn in any business I've ever done. Like this is the first time in 15 years. I thought I was mentally prepared for it, but yeah, you're not like your whole self image is tied up to these kind of, you know, the, oh yeah, my business is doing fine. My business is doing fine. And then suddenly it's not, and you have to reevaluate yourself. Um, and that's, I think the point where most people quit being an entrepreneur. Most people don't take 15 years to get there, right? They do six, year, six months, one year, two years, and their business fails. And they're like, nah, okay, I'm going to go back and get a job. Um, and that went through my mind during this period as well. I was like, huh, I have enough savings to buy a house in the, in the cabin in the woods. I'll, you know, let's say, how about I just declare bankruptcy, take all my money and just go there and never have to worry. You know, I mean, it wasn't real rational thoughts, but it was just like, you know, just to get out of that stressful situation. I'll add to all of that, that look, I watch what I eat. I work out every single day. I do martial arts and I meditate. So it wasn't like I was coming from this place where like I did nothing to deal with stress and I had no tools to deal with it. But even then, there's going to be a day in your entrepreneurship journey where you're going to be hit by a friggin' train. Like, you know, you've been, you know, you could be hitting the, the gym every single day. You're not strong enough to push back against the train, right? It is just going to run you over and, you know, spit you out the other end. It becomes your decision what you do at that point. I told you I fantasized about running away to the cabin and like that, not having all the stress, but that's, I, that's not who I am, right? I'm like, you know, I love what I do. So after all of the anxiety, it's not totally gone away, but kind of came back down to a manageable level. Boom, I'm back. Um, I'm looking for ways to innovate. Can I turn the ship around on this business? Maybe not. But I have other, you know, I have podcast talk. I I realized I had a website, learningstylequiz.com, where, huh, 100,000 people have taken that quiz in the last 12 months, and I have never monetized it. Like, I have no ads. I have, like, I don't ask for email addresses. I didn't do a thing. And I only found that out because to save money, I was, like all of us, we all have hundreds of domain names. Like one day we're going to use this domain to launch a business, right? So um, yeah, I can see Sean smiling. So, you know, you, 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 we're all guilty of that. We have like these domains that one day we're going to use it. So I had a ton, started doing that, consolidating servers. I had like four or five servers. And then I went, this was one of the sites. I'm like, oh, what should I keep this site? Like nobody uses it. And then I went to the, take a look. I'm like, wait, 120,000 120, people actually in the last 12 months have taken this learning style quiz. Holy crap. You know, so I went in there. I'm like, okay, I'm keeping this and I'm figuring out a way to monetize. My point is I will have other options. I'll do something else. I'll figure out a way, get myself up from the ground up. I bootstrapped all my businesses. When I didn't know what I was doing, I didn't have a network of entrepreneurs that I could reach out to for help. So now that I do have those things and I vaguely know what I'm doing after 15 years of doing it, I think I can do it again, even though it would not be a fun, you know. I'd be taking out the trash again in my first business, which is what I did in my first business. I'd essentially have to go back to that and work my way up. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm sure that wasn't easy. Um, yeah, I well, actually, I, I like sharing those like, things because most people don't. And again, this is part of entrepreneurship, not, not the glamorous part of entrepreneurship. Exactly. And that's why I do this because I think entrepreneurs need to hear this stuff. Exactly. Exactly. So I can say that uh, so I, two, two things have happened to me that have tested my resolve and have helped me to create a better, a higher bar for handling stress. The first one is having an investor is actually a, a really good way to test your resolve because 
whether they realize it or not, they are very difficult to work with. Mm-hmm. And about two weeks ago on July 22nd, 2022, I skydived. Ah, I've and done that a few times. I went into it. I, I've never done it before. I'm never going to do it again. But I went into it with the mindset that if I don't die from this, then surely I can handle a hell of a lot more things than I've told myself in the past I, mm-hmm. I couldn't handle. Because of number one, having an investor <laughs> exactly. is, is like a main thing. Um, so I, I feel like the skydive was really cool because like, I easily just said, okay, if I don't die from this, then this bar where I'm feeling a tremendous amount of stress and I'm having anxiety and not sleeping, that's going to evaporate because now the bar is up here because skydiving is freaking scary. I have a fear of heights too. So I, I could really, did you do tandem or static line? Uh, what is that? Oh, a t- tandem. I've only done. Yeah, you had a professional strapped to your back or did you get out on a, yeah. the wing of a plane and let go? Kind of there's the two options. Yeah. Yeah. No, I had a professional on me. Yeah. We jumped from 5,000 meters, which is about 16,500 feet. Mm-hmm. And I had another guy. So I like a guy, the, the instructor had a hand cam and then another guy came along with his own camera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I didn't do that on my first one, but my wife just skydo- skydived, skydove, whatever the guy's sense of. Yeah, exactly. Um, about two months ago for the first time, she's been wanting to do it her whole life. So we did it down in Playa del Carmen. She loved it. She has no fear heights at all. Like for her, it was just all exciting. I've done it a few times, not too many, like two or three times. And even then my legs go numb. Like, you know, they say, now put your feet out so you can roll and arch your back. No, I can't feel my legs. I just pick them up with my arm and I kind of put them out the side of the plane. And then I don't jump out. The pro jumps out, right? And you just happen to be attached to the professional and I happen to go with them. And I scream like a five-year-old schoolgirl on the entire way down. So that's that's my every single time it's been my skydiving experience. I tried to scream, but I couldn't breathe. <laughs> Because yeah. the air was rushing so fast uh, past me. I was like, am I supposed to breathe out of my nose, out of my mouth? Like this just, it doesn't feel like it's working very well. Yeah. And then my, my, I felt my arms were numb. Like when I got to the ground, I just slumped to the ground and like everything was totally numb and, and um, with p- uh, pins and needles and they ran over and gave me sugar and water. And I laid on the ground with my feet up for like half an hour. And- okay. Yours is much more hardcore than mine. Yeah. I mean, none of that ha- has happened to me, but you know, one thing I will say because we're talking about anxiety and stress today is if you do something that causes anxiety, you anxiety and stress and quote unquote, survive it. It's a guaranteed sign that you've grown as a person. Guaranteed. There's almost no other thing in life that points us in the right direction as much as anxiety and stress. If like you don't want to do something because it makes you anxious, makes you scared, and you do it anyway, you're a better, you're a different person. I'm not going to say better because you know I'd be anxious about taking crack cocaine. I probably would not be a better person after having done so. But you know you will have grown in one way or another because you've overcome your fear, your anxiety. You don't let it control you. You've actually gone and done something despite it. Not because, you know, and most of us spend, most of us live average lives. And the reason is, is most people build their lives about around avoiding anxiety and stress. That is kind of the guiding post in their life. There's anxiety and stress. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to avoid it. A few, the most successful people, the most people, most people we admire, they actually go through the anxiety and stress, right? It's not like they don't have it, but they look at it and they're like, okay. I see you. I'm going to kick your ass. And then they just keep it doing anyway. And they do it the next day. And the next time they see the same anxiety and stress, it just doesn't, it doesn't cause any, or it doesn't cause as much. So they beat it up again and they beat it up again. And then they go to that. And then they try something else totally new. And if you build your life about around doing one thing every single day that causes you a little bit of anxiety and stress, you'd be shocked at who you are five, 10 years down the road, right? Because you have just kind of blown through barriers along the way. So then what's something you do every day to stress yourself out? I'm an entrepreneur. I don't need to add any kind of artificial thing on top of uh, on top of my life. So I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a dad of a two year old. Even though I'm, I'm lucky, he's a pretty he's a healthy kid and he's a good kid. So you know, can't really I can't say he adds a huge amount of stress um, to my life. But it's just for those of you who don't have kids or you know maybe have older kids and don't remember these things. Having a child is like having another business. So I run multiple businesses and then I had a child. So I had like another business on top of it um, because it's that level of responsibility when you have a child and all of it together can, of course, 
cause a lot of stress. But my point is, I don't need to go and look for it. It comes to me, um, especially in these days. As I said, 15 years has probably been the most stressful 60 days of my entrepreneurship career. I've also been the most creative and productive in the last 15 years and the last 60 days. I don't know if it's going to work out. If I did, I wouldn't be stressed, right? Because I would know the results. But I don't know if this is going to work out. But hopefully, I will have grown as a person as a result of all of this. Because I'm really looking up my game out of this. Even if my current business, you know, Live Lingua doesn't survive for some reason. Uh, we're not that bad. But just, you know, as a pessimist, I always kind of look towards the worst case scenario. Um, even if it doesn't survive, I think I will have more skill sets out of this the last 60 days that will help, you know, me and my family succeed in the long run that I would not have had if this hadn't happened. I feel like we have to go through these crises. So, so I've been learning about cognitive behavioral therapy over the last six months. I'm, I'm doing it right now because of the, that was one of the things that they gave me. Uh, that, so I, I started working with a therapist because of that. I was telling you, I, I always think about the worst case scenario. And so far, you know, I'm like, I thought it was because I was always thinking of the, I was always planning ahead. But wow, when you're in a really high stress environment, that is not necessarily the best place to be. And that's what kept me up at night. So I, I've read every, I've read like six or seven books on cognitive behavioral therapy in the last 60 days and have an idea to build an app online in order to work people through it because nobody's built that yet. It's not even a money making thing. It would just be something I built for fun to help out other people who are going through a similar situations. Because I know mine is not that bad compared to other people. Like I'm stressed out about a business. People are stressed out about health concerns or about, you know, actual things that are, you know, could kill them. They're in war. I mean, you know, compared to that level of stress, I'm like, yeah, kind of a business is, I'm lucky that, that this is the only thing I'm stressed out about. So sorry to interrupt, but I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on that. If you had told me that six weeks ago, I wouldn't even know what it is. Now I've read most of the major books so, on Amazon. So on yeah, I, I came across it about six months ago. So I think the last time we spoke, I was in the middle of microdosing psilocybin. I don't know. Did I mention that to you? So I really I did that from did, like yeah. August of 2021 until about January of 2022. And then by March, okay. I was like, oh, this cognitive behavioral therapy thing. That sounds interesting. Let me take a look at that. I also had a therapist. I worked with them for a few months. Funny enough, I at the time had been staying with my parents for almost a year because of the pandemic. And I was finally ready to leave. And I was moving to Europe. I'm now in Europe. I swear to you, the day I got on the plane was not just the one of the hardest things to say bye to my parents and bye to the dog because I had spent like all day every day with this dog for almost a year but also one of the most like happy days because I was like yes I'm gonna be living my own life again because when I was with them I was living for them and for the dog and for my grandma and I was just spending most of my time doing for other people so I was like now I can be selfish again and at that instant, I almost felt like I didn't need the therapist anymore because I felt like a lot of the anxiety I had was not just around my business, but also around taking care of my family. And eventually, about maybe a month or so ago, I, I ended it with him, mostly because I have the education in psychology. So he wasn't really even like leading me through the the therapies. He was just kind of like giving me information and letting me work on it on my own because he could tell I didn't need him to do that. And I was like, well, why am I paying you to give me information I could find online for free? Exactly. And now, oddly enough, not to go up on a, on a tangent about CBT, right? There's actually very little information online that, you know, you can find out what it is, but like really finding out the steps for it. Now there are some decent books. Uh, I'll have to go and get my Kindle to figure out, re remember the names. There's one that's CBT for insomnia, which is one of the first ones that I worked through. Um, because, you know, again, when you're sleeping two hours a night, that is your biggest priority is to try to get yourself to sleep more. So that was kind of a, what I was focusing on. But for those who are watching who are not familiar with the concept, basically cognitive behavioral therapy is we all have these autopilots that we work through in our mind as far as thinking, right? We, have, we combine emotion, thought, and action. And we kind of put it into a capsule and we think it's all exactly the same thing, right? I feel this, I do this, and um, I think this, and it is one thing. But what cognitive behavioral therapy helps you do is it breaks down all of those into three different things. So, for example, if somebody has an eating disorder and they look at a cake, that causes the emotion of really wanting a cake, which causes the action of going and eating the cake, right? But it's actually not just I saw the cake and I ate the cake. There's actually a process that you go through. 
a lot of these we've built based on how we lived, how we grew up and all the rest. Like we don't think about these processes because they're so ingrained in us. For me, I mentioned the pessimism was that. And I, you know, it was, this happened. I then I'm like, so let's say the business is going down. I am a failure and I'm going to live on the street. It's kind of, that's how my mind would go automatically, right? And there are some steps in between. What cognitive behavioral therapy helps you do is intercept it at the initial thought point and come up with a more rational way of going through it. Now, it's not to say things are going badly. No, everything's going to be great because that's actually useless as well, right? If you go to the opposite extreme and you're, you know, if you work with a therapist that tries to make you work on and you'll always come out with the best, it's not realistic, right? You know, if I said, oh, business is going down, but that's okay, I'm going to win the lottery tomorrow, right? Like, that's not like a realistic way of doing it. But what they would do is help you recognize who you really are and what's a more likely outcome of this, right? Have you Has your business had a, uh, again, for me, is your business in a down, down slump? Yes. But are you the kind of person who's probably going to be on, with your skill set and your background, are you, are you going to go run out of all your money, lose all your friends and be on the street a year from now? That's probably not a very realistic outcome of this situation, right? But my mind would go there, which would have the emotional and anxiety related to it. Um, so basically, that's what cognitive behavioral therapy that helps you do. It helps you catch it up point number one, and come up, retrain your brain to go to those opposite, you know, go to another pattern. And an example I'll use here is I had a friend, I was in the Peace Corps, right? So which is a volunteer organization. And there was this one girl who was in the Peace Corps with me, and I admire her a lot. Um, and she grew up with a single mom and abusive dad, I know her boyfriend right before she joined the Peace Corps committed suicide, like after they broke up and called her on the phone to do it. I mean, it was some awful, awful stuff, right? She was the happiest person I've ever met in my life. And I, you know, when you meet her, she was always happy. And, I'm, and then she would tell us these things. I'm like, how can you be this happy? Like, I mean, how can you choose? But she's like, I choose to be this happy every single day. These awful things happened, but they happened. And I'm not letting that affect me who I am every single day. And that was a conscious decision she made when she was 10. And she trained her brain not to always focus on the bad and always think of the worst case scenarios. Bad stuff happens, but she had come up with a way of dealing with it and was happier as a person for it. So she's somebody who's taking cognitive behavioral therapy, even though I don't think she knows it was even called that. And she's trained her brain to go to the opposite extreme. I think more of us go to that negative extreme. And that's why we need some help. So to me, it was fascinating. And I'm like, oh. It's an engineer. There's a science behind how to do this, right? It's not foo-foo. It's not like you're born this way. You might have been born a certain way, but you can actually over time with hard work reprogram your brain so it does stuff differently. I don't, I'm not scared of hard work. And if you, you tell me, oh, you will be a happier person by doing this, it's just going to take you six months, a year, two years to do it. Heck yeah. Two years, that's nothing. I've been going to the gym for 20 years because I was that skinny Asian kid in school, right? I mean, you know, I'm Two, three years, that's like that to me. I've been running businesses for, I'm building businesses for 15. If you told me a successful business in two, I'd be like, Psh. you know, I could do that in my sleep. So that was, it was an exciting discovery for me. And I'm really excited to see where it's going to take me in a little bit. And I'll probably build a free app for people to use at some point because that's what I do. Everything I look at, I'm like, how can I make a business out of this? I'll charge the psychiatrists who, who put their therapists on there, but people who want to use it to kind of to work through the steps of cognitive behavior therapy, I'm going to plan on offering for free. I think what I've seen is so like uh, when I was in university, we weren't taught cognitive behavioral therapy. It wasn't mentioned once in four years. Exactly. Yeah. That's the point. I'm like, imagine for you, it never got mentioned. I'm a computer engineer. I'm like, this is just like, this is, you know, I know nothing about this whole world. Um, so if you guys don't even know about it, imagine the rest of us, how ignorant we are of even these kind of tools which everybody should use. I mean, regardless of whether you're going through anxiety, these are the kind of tools that you should have before you're anxious, right? Because trust me, when you're in the middle of stress, it's not the time to learn how to do these things, right? I mean, you should have these tools in place so that when stress comes, you know how to deal with it. Right. So like, let's say I took a, a cognitive behavioral class, no, not cognitive behavioral. I took like a neurological class, right? So I learned about the different parts of the brain. So I would hear about the different scientists and how they did research and what they learned and therefore this theory came out of this thing or uh childhood development you know what are the different aspects of, of childhood development you know what's the timeline of their development at what age can they 
you know, crawl and walk and stand and run and process language and speak. And like, there's all these different things and, and they were discovered by different kinds of people. But when it comes to the actual analysis and therapy, mostly it's Freudian and Jungian and a little bit of Skinner. And a, a lot of that has been disproved. Yeah. Like a lot of it's been, so I mentioned, I didn't have too much, but my dad actually studied family psychology in his undergrad, right? So he was a family therapist for two years, but he said he worked in a family clinic and he's like, wow, that was so depressing because he worked in like the inner city. And he's like, yeah, after two years, I'm like, I would have been at depression if I had continued on that career. So his career took him somewhere else um, while he was doing it. But, you know, he went on to study theology, right? So, you know, we, we are, are, I come from a family of academics. So our dinner conversations were like theology and philosophy and, uh, you know, and a little psychology kind of thrown in there. And they're even saying like the old Jungian psychology is, has been largely disproved, right? Because the Jungian and cognitive behavioral therapy talks about this as well, right? If you went to an old a psychiatrist 50 years ago, hundred years ago, you know, after when the Jungian thing was in place, let's say you had a fear of crossing a bridge, right? You had a fear of heights. So you go up to a bridge and you can't cross it. You're terrified. You move it back. Um, if you went to an old Jungian psychiatrist, he would say, well, let's go to your childhood. Maybe you crossing a bridge is a metaphor for your mom not loving you as a kid, right? Um, and a lot of the science, a lot of the studies right now have shown that that's not really the case. You have a fear of heights maybe because when at some point in your life, something happened and you were stuck on a bridge and there was something that caused you to be really scared of heights, right? Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is what I like about it, it follows the whole, um, I'll recommend a book called Talent Code, which I just read. I thought it was a business book, totally not a business book. It was about the human mind. Um, but basically, you know, we all have neurons. And then neurons fire, and then, you know, we follow along this trail. And this whole book is about the trail, actually, which is called myelin, which is, the you know, what connects the two neurons. And what happens is the more you use it, this, this little road, this myelin, kind of gets thicker. And that's why in athletes, right, you can move before you even think, because you just fire those neurons for, like, shooting a basketball at this position have just been built up over so much time that it's not even conscious thought, right? Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests, that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much. And we'll take you back to the show now. You do it, your body does it before you can think it before you can consciously think it, even though your mind, because it, you know, it fired along these pathways. The problem is if you want to fire along a different pathway, it's super slow because you haven't trained your mind to do that. And what cognitive behavioral therapy does in the case of the person who has the fear of heights is you have fear of heights, you walk up to a bridge. And then since you have fear of heights, you turn away and walk away. And then that gives you that endorphin rush, which is like, phew, I don't have to cross that bridge, which then it reinforces that thought pattern in the myelin in your brain because you just reinforced it because you didn't cross the bridge. And the idea is, you know, every time you go to a bridge, you turn away and you have that little rush of endorphin because you don't have to cross the bridge. And you've trained your mind to be, you know, to push you towards not crossing that bridge because that gives you endorphins instead of the fear, which is when you're crossing the bridge. And so what cognitive behavioral therapy does is it, you know, essentially helps you reprogram those things so that the satisfaction comes in a different path. So you're not going down, then you start crossing the bridge and over and over again. So yeah, psychiatry is amazing. Uh, I have, again, Probably 50 years down the road, they might be saying, yeah, you don't remember that cognitive behavioral therapy thing? Science has totally disproven that. But I, you know, I'm hopeful that this will, this actually is something that's there. And I mentioned, to me, it's been so impactful on my like worldview that before I would say there are two things I wish that they taught in every school that they don't, which was nutrition and basic finance, right? How to manage your money. Nobody teaches that. That should be you know, part of K through 12 education, like, you know, carbs, protein, fat, and how many calories they have. Like you could do it in a day, but they don't, they don't teach us how to eat ever. Right. They don't teach us how to manage our money ever. Um, and I, now that I've learned about this, this is the third thing I add to the list. They should teach maybe not specifically cognitive behavioral therapy, but something like this to help people deal with stress. Emotional intelligence should be taught 
to every kid in K through 12 at least one semester so that when the inevitable life stuff happens, we're not like I was when this happened, like, what the heck is this and what's going on? Right. We at least had these bases and at least I'm like, okay, I remember somebody mentioned something about this in high school 20 years ago. And I at least had a starting point to kind of investigate. But I had I went through a week of not sleeping before I even found what this, you know, vaguely what was going on. Um, I thought I had like something medically was going off because I've been stressed before, but none of this these reactions had ever happened to me before. So it was, it's been fascinating. I want to touch you know, on those the, what you just said, where a few years ago I was in undergoing a tremendous amount of stress from my business and that was at the moment also when i was starting the podcast and i was also engaged but not married yet and i thought there was something wrong okay. with me i was getting headaches i was feeling dizzy i was gaining weight i had no idea what was going on with me mm -hmm. and I realized after a year and a half or so that it was anxiety and stress. I was making yeah. myself dizzy. That it's that's the incredible thing about it, right? So I think there are two sides to it, at least in my opinion, right? The first one is we don't know how much stress can affect our health. I mean, you know, people tell us that anxiety and stress can affect our health and it lead to depression. I probably had depression for a few days in there, right? Because like we talked about it. I practice a Japanese martial art called Kendo. I love it. I've been doing it for 20 years. I did not feel like going to practice. I couldn't get myself to go to practice for like those two or three weeks. And I'm like, this has not happened in 20 years. Like I always look forward to go. Even on days when I've had a crappy day at work, I go to practice and I know I'm going to feel really good afterwards. Right. And I couldn't, I would make excuses and I'm like, okay, something is obviously going on with me, you know, at that point, this, this is not natural. I think the second side is a lot of people don't ask for help. And so I'm half Filipino. And in the Philippines, you would – like there are almost no therapists and psychiatrists because there's just simply no work because nobody would go to them. Um, I know you, Sean, have experience in China. I bet, I bet you it's a, probably an Asian, an Asian thing in general. It's because if you have to go and ask for help, it's because something's wrong with you. They don't look at it as like a medical condition. If on the extreme side, if they're very religious, it's like it's a punishment from, you know, the higher power. That's why this is going on. You know, you're anxious this way. You're not eating. You're stressed. You're putting on weight. Ah, it's a punishment. You know, it's not a medical condition that's happening. It's not some physiological thing that's going on in your mind because caused by your stress. So nobody even gets help because if you go and ask for help, you're admitting something's wrong with you, which is kind of the second side of it, right? Um, kind of looping back to the initial part of this discussion entrepreneurs when you see like you see richard branson and elon musk they're like always like Oof, i bet you most of those people have seen therapists or are seeing therapists in their lives right but that's not what's put forward to the public what's put forward to this public is like a superhero right like ah, i got this figured out i got everything i know tons of entrepreneurs i've met richard branson they're humans like the rest of us right i mean these are not people who are superhumans they have they have our foibles I bet you they are stressed. I mean, in some cases, look at CEOs. What, 50% of them are divorced? Elon Musk? Right. I don't know. He's been married he's, a few times. He's also uh, I mean, had I, I, kids with like yeah, exactly. an executive and a few other people. Maybe maybe yeah, Sergey exactly. Brin's <laughs> wife. There you go. That's my point. That's, that's exactly my point, right? They are not superhumans. I bet you they're stressed. I bet you they're there. They just don't talk about it. I wish they did because if people like that start talking about it, if people who are like higher up than you on whatever totem pole you want to use in your life start talking about these things, it would be more accepted as part of society. You know, as I said, I would be surprised if most successful entrepreneurs or business or CEOs have not seen a therapist or a psychiatrist at some point in their life. I'd be shocked. But I, the number of people who've actually talked about it is probably like a fraction of 1%. I would say... A number of the people I've talked to have told me they've seen a therapist and they're pretty open about it. They, I don't know if they would say it on air, but they've, they've told me. That's the difference. Yeah. Publicly is very different in private. Yeah. You, you'll tell your friends I went one, especially if you, if you like know somebody, but that's one of the things, you know, I try to be open about the challenges that I go through. I might've mentioned it on yours. Like my wife and I just struggled mm -hmm. six years to have a kid. That until this point was the most stressful thing that ever happened in my life. The interesting thing there is, you know, one out of five people, it's about 20% of couples struggle to have kids. 
I had no idea. It's a much more common. Yeah. Because you know, when you get to know people, you talk to them, you do it. But it's not until you're a person going through it, you don't even look up that statistic because nobody talks about it. This is taboo. Because in the beginning is if you can't have children, something's wrong with you. My wife and I had all the tests that you know they could do. And they're like, you guys are fine. We have no idea why you can't have kids. Mm. There's nothing wrong with you. And even if there is a medical condition, it's not your fault most of the time, right? It's just something genetic. Something happened. You had a sickness when you were a kid. You had to go through... If you're a woman who went through chemotherapy when you were 12, you might be infertile when you get older because it's not your fault. But people don't talk about these things. People don't, you know, people don't talk about the failure in the business. They don't talk about the stress. They don't talk about the medical issues. Um, and I'd love to have contribute my small part to change. Yeah, I mean, I have a friend who is in his mid-30s and him and his wife have been struggling to have a kid. And I think they're trying to do IVF now and they're just mid-30s, like... You know. Oh, and it is super stressful. So, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, it, you feel like a failure if you go through because we did rounds of IVF and it doesn't work. It's like losing a child every single wow. time, every single time, because for two weeks you're pregnant because yeah, it's called the two week wait. It's actually there's, a, there's like a word for it when they, you know, when they actually do the procedure and before you know the results. And in your mind, for those two weeks, wow. you have a child. It, it's the, it's the, uh, what's it? Schrodinger's it's like you're pregnant, dog, you're pregnant, but you're not pregnant called, at the same right? time. That's exactly it. Until you open the box, you have no idea. And then imagine for two weeks, dreaming, daring to hope that you're going to have a child and then seeing the results and you don't. It's like losing that child. And we went through multiple rounds of that. So yeah. Again, learn emotional intelligence because life is not easy. I mean, you know, life is only easy if you don't try to do things. Like, you know, if your goal in life is to sit in a cave and just eat bugs, life might be kind of easy until you probably get sick from eating bugs at some point. Um, but generally speaking, life is hard. And I wish schools gave us more tools. To I agree. Able. I've been saying this for a very long time. You actually mm -hmm. gave me an idea for two more questions. Uh, Questions I can ask on Help a Reporter. Well, no, not not asking Fire you. Away. Questions I can ask on Help a Reporter to find other <laughs> potential guests. So one of them, oh, okay. one of them is uh, what Fire has away. been your experience being an entrepreneur and going through IVF, and the other mm -hmm. is what is like being an entrepreneur and going mm -hmm. through the adoptive process. We looked into that as well. So we, you know, it's I'm half Filipino. We looked to adopt from the Philippines. And I thought being Filipino would give me this big advantage, and I'd be like, nope. They're like, you have to move here for three years. I'm like, what? No, I'm a citizen. Can I just, oh, if you've already lived here three years, you can get it in three to six months. Well, you have to live here three years first before you can start the adoption process. And I'm like, but if you adopt from the United States through an international adoption agency, it'll take six to 12 months. Like that doesn't make any sense at all. I can adopt somebody from the Philippines, from the US faster by being an American because I have dual nationality than I can as a Filipino adopting in the Philippines. You so yeah, as we were looking at that, my wife, pure luck got pregnant and we have a beautiful naturally running around right now um but naturally yeah but it was crazy yeah yeah it was no i mean we tried we were told we couldn't get pregnant i mean that we were moving on with our lives like you know at that point so it was nobody was as surprised as us there was this weird thing that happened with my ex-wife and i i don't know if you knew that we got we got mm -hmm. divorced uh okay there was this weird thing I've never experienced with any other woman and she's never experienced with any other man. And it's, it's kind of like, it's different because it's not as like long-term, I guess, as the stress you had with your wife and IVF and all that. But like, and this is so weird. I don't think anyone's ever said this on air and I feel horrible saying it because like, it's not fair for her, but there was something about the way our bodies worked with each other that she would get rashes and have pain after sex. Yeah. And I would wash and she would wash, but for some reason it was almost as if like she was allergic to me. Human beings are unique and different and who knows, uh, you know, something to do with the sweat. I mean, yeah, who, I, I thought I, about I'm, it. I have no medical background. I'm a computer engineer. I mean like, you know, so don't, don't come to me for medical. No, advice. I, but, but it was, you know, yeah. It was stressful for our relationship. You know, I'm trying to run this company and I'm, and I'm trying to have a relationship with someone who I care about. And like all of this stuff is happening to her and, and to me. And it's like, there's no book for this. Like nobody talks about, you know, how you're probably allergic literally to your spouse, you know? And 
Yeah, you can Google it. Yeah, there's there's no Reddit thread about it. I mean, yeah, there there are these weird things that happen out there, you know, in relationships and lives and everything. That yeah, we can't be prepared for it. We just need to have the tools. You know, we should have. I wish we had more tools to. We were taught more tools to deal with these things when they happen because they are inevitable. All of us are going to have something really weird happen to us. You know that we never expected before. Hmm. So earlier you were talking about thinking about stopping your business during this whole crisis recently. How close did you get to actually pulling the plug and going, screw it, let's just kill Live Lingua? Because you talked about going to the woods. But like, how Not that close. Okay. In this, yeah. Yeah. I, it couldn't have been that close because I have responsibility to the, people, the team at Live Lingua. If it was just me, who knows, right? It could have happened. Because it was a bit, you know, I, just me I was taking care of. But now I actually have a team at Live Lingua that I also have to look after what was there. So I never really did it. I had to figure out a way to solve it. Unfortunately, part of that was letting some of the team go. Okay. So then what's been one of the hardest decisions you've had to make? I guess I'm assuming it's different from letting people go. Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest one was, of course, letting people go. Because this is the first time in my professional career I've hired people. I've fired people who were good at their jobs. I've hired tons of people who are really bad at their jobs before. It's still not fun. I'm like, you know, I don't enjoy firing people. It's part of it's failure on my part as much as it's probably failure on their part, right? Either I didn't bet them right, I didn't coach them right, I didn't train them right. But for some reason, they weren't able to do their jobs. Uh, but the other hardest person was to, the hardest part, and it's still going on, because I mean, this is a pretty recent event, like 30, 60 days ago. Talking about it to my peers, right? Because you... There's a side to it. It's your own self-image. I am a successful entrepreneur. That's how I define myself. And suddenly you're not, or you're not as successful or whatever, right? And going to your peers who look at you as a successful entrepreneur and saying, you know, I'm not as successful right now. So what, 60 days ago? The thing is, though, and that was really, really hard for me. The reaction of was totally the opposite of what I expected, uh, which logically is probably the reaction that I should have expected, but again, pessimist, right? Uh, pessimist says you're not gonna—they're not gonna talk to you, they're not gonna respect you, they're not gonna be your friends anymore. Truth is, they're your friends, and they are bending over backwards. Like, how can we help? What can we do? You know, is there anything we can do to help you? We're here to talk. We're here. To, you know, we'll give introductions in business. We can help you with any of these kind of things that you want. Across the board, I'm like, there is not a single exception. Even people that I didn't even know I was that good friends with kind of vaguely hear about what's happening. I'm getting emails like, hey, Ray, I heard you're in tough times. Is there anything I can do to help? I was almost emotional. I'm not a very emotional guy when that happened. And I was surprised at that kind of reaction. Like, you know, it's it gives you it gives you faith in humanity again. I guess it is. I mean, me as a pessimist, I'm like, nah, human beings suck. <laughs> you know, no, no, but no, human beings are good is what I'm finding out from all of this, right? Mm -hmm. There are stuff in life that sucks, and there are individual humans that are probably, you know, awful human beings. In general, most people are good. They want what's good for you. They're not looking out to, you know, screw you and stab you in the back. Um, and I think if I can figure out a way to live that way, expecting that more, I'll be a happier person. I'll let you know how, once I figure out how to do that, though. Uh, but, you know, I'm trying to change 40 years of programming here, uh, of, of 40 years of worldview, and that does not happen in a few weeks. It was funny because you labeled you you have already labeled several cognitive distortions. I have that list. I printed it out. Oh, I like I got an eighty percent on that quiz. There were ten of them, and I got eighty. I got eight, eight. I have eight of them, and I was like, I don't think this is a test. I wanted to score a B on <laughs> because I was like, you know, I scored an eight out of ten on the test. You probably should not do that. But I have a huge amount of cognitive distortions out there. I always look at worst case right, scenario. I always like you know yeah. Catastrophism. Yeah, I can't remember all the names. I'll have to bring it up. It's on my desktop. But I was like, oh, that's me. The other oh, one was like... That's me too. Oh, focusing on the big big problems and ignoring the good and focusing on the bad. I do that. Like, you know, I can have all these good stuff happen and one bad thing happens and that's what I focus on. So I did that one right. too. You were just mentioning how you expected everybody would be the same and yet they were. You were just wrong about the way that they were going to respond. The way that they were. Exactly. No, no, no. I told you. I joked with my therapist. I'm like, wow, I scored a B on a test. I should have, you know, you, you're you meant to score a zero on. And I scored eight out of 10 on it. So I'm like, that, that probably is not healthy. So, yeah. What would you say has been your most expensive mistake? Oh, 
I, I, the reason I'm thinking is I've had so many. Uh, I'm like, oh, so I'm trying to do the math. I hired a coach that costs five figures a month for six months, and it didn't do crap. That probably was my most expensive. Business. I thought because they were expensive and highly recommended, and they had built a nine-figure business before. Nine? Eight figure, multi, multi eight, like mid eight figure business before in my industry that they'd be, you know, they would just be, they were the silver bullet, right? Work with them and they'll make my money back hundredfold. Did not work out at all. What was it that you felt you didn't get value? Like what, was there something that they did or was it something that they didn't do? I think the, the issue was the size of my business as being, you know, seven figures. What you do with seven figures and what you do in eight figure business is, is different, right? And this person was focused on like micro changes in the business while we needed bigger, you know, more sweeping changes across the business. And I just don't think he was the right, per like obviously knows what he's doing. Very successful business person. I just don't think he was the right person for the right time in my business. Right. Maybe if we got eight figures, his advice would be more, you know, would have been easier to apply. And some of the stuff that he gave me was, he's like, okay, we need to start doing this three times a day. And I'm like, look, I don't have staff to do this. Like, I mean, you know, I don't have staff to be just full-time dedicated to doing like what you're asking to do. We're a small team, you know, we're 12, 12, 15 people and they're all busy. They're not sitting there waiting for me to give them all these little tasks that we talk every week and like, okay, now we're doing this. Now we're doing this in a big company. You probably have extra people to do that. Right. Where you can just go boom, boom, boom. This whole team dedicated to experimenting. I don't have that. And so that that was kind of, I think, part of why it didn't work out. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting because I've, I've been, I've struggled myself with this because I know how to build a seven-figure business. I haven't built an eight-figure business. I would like to learn how. There's really not people out there that are talking about this except for Alex Hormozzi. Yeah, big fan. Um, I actually had a chance to be on a call with him with like five other people of, ooh, a few months back. I got a friend of mine invited, so I had a chance to chat with him. He will not remember me at all, obviously, um, because I'm sure he does that with like tens of thousands of people all the time. But wow, is he smart. Um, and actually, I'm just finishing up Gym Launch for the second time because for Live Lingua, we're, we're revamping our product. So I'm reading Gym Launch, which is for gyms, but not that different from language courses, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, it's one of those things where you you know, you know want to learn Spanish. You, I think the phrase he uses there is... Nobody wants to learn Spanish. Everybody wants to speak Spanish or Mandarin in your case, right? Nobody wants to learn. Everybody wants the results. So we're changing a lot of that. We're adding guarantees like live lingua we're going to become. We just found a certification. We are going to be the first language teaching platform online, which is going to guarantee results. Guaranteed. No other language learning platform guarantees that you're going to have results. Now we are, that's going to be for our high end, like high end product. So what we're looking at is like for about $2,500, $3,000. You will have unlimited Spanish lessons for one year, and we guarantee you're going to have advanced level of Spanish at the end of the year. Otherwise, we work with you forever until you get to that level for free, guaranteed. And that the guarantee is from a third party where they will certify you as an advanced Spanish level. It's not even us. Like Otherwise, we're like, Sean, yeah, yeah, you're advanced. But you can say, like, buenos dias. We're like, no, no, you're advanced. You got it, right? And we won't do it. No, it's a third party that's internationally recognized, which will certify you as an advanced Spanish speaker. And until you get that, you will work with us for free after, after the... the Using like the A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, like this level? We were using ACTFEL, which is a slightly, they don't use the A's, but especially in the US, most people don't know it, but it's ACTFL. What you're doing is called the CEFR, C -E -F -R, which is the common framework from, the, from Europe, right? A1, B2. But the problem is for Americans, it's like, wait, C is higher than A? Because we're, we're trained to go the right. other way around, right? But the way that the ACTFEL does it, which is the American Council for Foreign Language, is it goes, it, to me, it makes more, your, your basic, intermediate, and advanced, and then this basic, 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 intermediate, basic, advanced, intermediate, low, intermediate, mid, intermediate, Jesus. advanced, and you work your way up that way. No, but it actually it corresponds exactly to the actual levels of A1, A2, and they just kind of go across. But the way you explain it, like if I said to somebody in the street in the United States, you're a, I'm a B2 in Mandarin, they'd be like, what the heck are you talking about? But if you go up to them and say, I'm an intermediate mid in Mandarin, at least you have a vague idea that this person is probably somewhere in the middle of the Mandarin learning scale, right? So we're, we use the actual scale a little bit more. Um, but we actually, you can also use the Sefer scale. We'll, because we give you that pre-exam as part of this course. Um, you could choose to take the ACTFEL or the Sefer exam at the end, but then it's, then we guarantee you're going to get, you know, to a C level at least, um, in Spanish at the end of this year, if you complete our course. And again, if not, we will work with you forever. And it's unlimited hours during that year, right? Um, because 
So we have a curriculum to go through, but if we have to spend five hours on a certain topic, you're not paying extra for it. It's all included. Plus there's free conversation classes on top of all the unlimited one-on-one lessons, all the rest. But the whole point is we're basing it off of Alex Harmozy's gym launch kind of packaging thing, right? Cool. Where we're going to give a higher end package that, but guaranteeing results. Have you read a hundred million dollar offers? Yes, I read that one first, and then I went to Jim Launch to, to to do the offer ones as well. Yeah, so I've read all of it. I've subscribed to his YouTube channel, even have his podcast thing on there. Every once in a while, I try not listening to too much because he has so many good ideas that for somebody with ADHD, lost. I'm like, Woo! yeah, I'm like, I have too many things to bounce around with. So I'm like, I'll, I keep him, and even his wife. If you go to Layla, because I need to wear his wife, Layla Hermosa. Yeah. She just, she focuses more on operations. That's a weakness for me. So I force myself to watch some of her stuff because she's good at what I'm bad yeah. at. So I need to kind of get better at that. Well, so as I was saying, I like I had a mentor who helped me to understand seven figures. And I don't even think he realized that he helped me to understand it when he was doing it. Cause I don't think he was he had gotten there when he was helping me. But afterwards I was like, oh shit, what are where do I go next? There's just nobody. And so for the last five or six years, I've just been kind of floundering because I don't know where the fuck I'm going. I don't know how to get there. And then Alex Hermosi comes along and I'm like, interesting, but like this guy's fucking thinking at nine figures. It's not helping me to get to eight. He talks about how to get to he's eight. He's trying to get to 10. Right. Yeah, he's trying to get to 10, right? Like yeah, so. he, he talks about how to do it. And like, I, I understand what needs to be done kind of, but like my startup's just not there. And this other company we live to build isn't there yet because I don't have the cash flow to really grow the team yet. So like... I, I'm just in this this weird space in between at the moment, but so in my experience, I'll just give you you know I've never gotten eight figures yet. I plan on it. Uh, part of it's self confidence. I will even say I'll declare here I will get to an eight figure business. Absolutely. Um, well, I will do get to an eight figure exit is my goal. So my business might only be like mid seven figures at that point, but I, my goal is to get to an eight figure exit. Um, to get to seven figures, it's actually easy. The, I mean, the way is easy. Um, it's hustle. To get you to, from zero to seven figures, you got to work your butt off. And I've done multi, multiple six figures and seven figure businesses, right? It's always work your butt off. Like you, I get stuck at the seven or low, low multi seven. At that point, it's more about figuring, it's developing your systems and growing them at that. You know, that's what I'm learning right now. Now, I don't know how to do it yet, which is what, I, what I'm still working on, right? But because at that point, you've already validated your idea from zero to seven. You're like, you know, this is what I sell. This is what people want to buy. This is what I'm going to do. Seven will get you there. Work your butt off. I'm talking 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can get up to seven figures. You might need to build a small team around you to do it. Um, you have to find the right product market fit. So maybe not first or second or third ideal hit, but... Once you find an idea that hits, focus on that. It'll get you seven figures. After that, it's operations, 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 operations um, to get you up there. One thing that I've made a mistake on a multiple one of one of my businesses. So my specialty is I'm pretty good at marketing and I'm really good at finding product market fit, right? I'm, you know, I've never had a business not make money ever. So I'm just don't make as much as I want. Um, the challenge is once you find product market fit, you have to make the product really, really, really good. And as somebody with ADD and the creative, that's not really my my passion, right? I built the basic product that people want, but somebody else has to go in there. Like I'm the coal and I sold you the coal. I need somebody to kind of polish it, make it a diamond. And that's what gets you to eight figures, that polishing diamond operation. Then, and then you just have a system where you throw in coal and diamond comes out the other end <laughs> every single time. That's an eight figure business. And you know, I haven't figured that part out. I can get you the coal that somebody's willing to pay a hundred bucks for. I can do that. Um, so I'm working on the second part. Yeah. Operations has never really been my strong thing either. I also have the ADD. And so like, I'll get an idea. We need to get better at it if we want to get the eight figures. Like, you know, unfortunately, it's part of it's the self-talk. Like I was doing it too. Like I would say, I'm just not good at operations. And I would just leave it there. And I would use that as an excuse never to get any better at operations. Because I'm like, I suck at operations. We need to get better at it. Will we be as good as somebody who's a natural integrator? Like, you know, using the whole traction analogy. Maybe not. But in order to get the seven figures, to get those people, we need to be able to pay $150,000 a year. Like that integrator who's like a rock star at it, at least. And you're not going to be able to pay somebody $150,000 a year until you at least become like an 80% integrator. Right? And get that operations up to 80%. So if that's holding you back, figure out what's holding you back and get really, really good at it. Um, you know, get better at that instead of focusing on what you're really, really good at all the time and trying to improve it 
improving what you're good at 1% is not going to make as much difference as improving what you suck at from 20% to 50%. I've learned from my team, actually. So like I, my COO, I hired him. He's been a good friend of mine for 20 plus years. I hired him into the startup uh, about three years ago. And he was like, well, you did a shit job. Like, he, like knowing you, like, I know you've done your best. My COOs tell me too. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, yeah, you're, you're crap at this is what they tell <laughs> right, me. He's like, yeah. he's like, knowing you as your friend, good effort. As your COO, it's <laughs> absolute shit. And he spent the last mm -hmm. few years trying to improve upon it. And I've been able to learn by watching him. And he like whipped up this hiring process on ClickUp and automated it. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like I would never, it, that wouldn't even occur to me to like even do any of it. But could that. you do it? Exactly. It wouldn't occur to you because we don't train ourselves to think that way. We, like, we don't even look at it. But intellectually, when you look at it, is it something you physically could have done? I don't know how he's done. To come it. up with. If, I don't know how he's done it. I still don't know. Okay, how well, he's you done have it. to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, go you go and look at. But the thing is, generally, when I look at operations, it's not like rocket science in the sense that they came up with something that I would never have thought of. They just did it. They made a system when. So I have one more minute, but then I have to go. So uh, sorry about this, but I'll leave it with this one thought. Where the problem with a lot of entrepreneurs is we're pretty smart. Oh, the advantage of a lot of entrepreneurs is we're pretty smart. The challenge is we're pretty smart. It means we are able to figure out most things and we assume everybody else can as well. And that's what holds us back. Because when I look at a problem, I never bother to build a system because whenever a problem comes around, I'll just figure out how to solve it in the moment, right? Um, and, you know, Sean, I can see you smile because it's like it's the same thing, right? If, if a problem comes, you're like, I'll figure it out, right? Problem is, if you want to grow a business, that's not a way to grow your business. If you're expecting every single one of your staff members to just figure it out every time something goes wrong, not everybody is able to or knows the business well enough or something to do that. So you need to create a system. You need to write down what you just figured out once so that somebody else can go and like, how did Sean do it last time? And to go and do it the next time. So that's what operations people are really, really good at doing. Um, There's actually a book I just finished reading. I'll recommend this. Thank you. Systemology. It's how to create... It's, my camera might be backwards, but systemology, how to create systems for people who hate creating systems. So I'll leave you guys with that note. Brilliant. I'm going to get that now. All right. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Sean. Cheers. Have a good one.